Uh, hello, everybody. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Austin from the University of Maryland, and he'll be presenting updates uh, today on the research task WRT uh, 1025 using AI and machine learning design patterns for digital twins uh, and model centric engineering. Uh, with that, I turn it over to you, Dr. Austin. Thank you very much. Okay, so my name is Mark Austin. I'm with the University of Maryland in College Park, and this is work that's done jointly with Maria Cohello. She is a PhD student in civil systems here at Maryland. And Mark Blackburn, whom I assume you all know, who is now part of Stevens. Um, can we have the next slide, please? So the title of this talk is um, uh, Digital Twins and Their Effect on um, 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 So, oh my goodness, okay. So as a starting point, let's, um, the first question is, what some of you may be wondering what is a digital twin so for the purposes of this project a digital twin is a virtual representation of a physical object or system that operates across a system life cycle and what we want to understand is um can we mirror the implementation of this physical world through real-time monitoring and synchronization of data with events and support those activities with algorithms and software for observing reasoning and physical systems control. So the idea of digital twins has been around for about 20 years. And in the past two decades, many applications of digital twins have, have, have sort of spawned. Um, it was, it's an idea that originally came from NASA, but now you find them in manufacturing processes, building operations, smart cities, medical applications, and so forth. Next slide, please. So from a business standpoint, um the timeliness of this whole digital twin era is uh is partly driven by siemens uh and so the picture at the top right hand side of the slide shows their vision for where they see systems engineering going in the next you know decade or so so according to them model-based systems engineering basically hit its peak back in the 2000 2010 era and from now through to maybe 10, 2030 and beyond, uh, we're gonna enter this era of digital twins. And so they clearly see the digital twin era as a successor to model-based systems engineering with SysML. So what would happen if this, if this was to happen? You know, so the first thing is we need, we'll need new methods and tools. Um, we'll need new operating system environments. And if these digital twins are to be uh, useful, then they're going to need to provide superior levels of performance, agility, economy, all kinds of things that systems engineers want. And so a next question might be, well, what might the technical implementation of such a digital twin look like? And all you have to do is look around today and see what you know, companies like Google and Apple and Amazon and Siemens and IBM and so forth are all doing. And essentially they're developing software and algorithms where you have artificial intelligence and machine learning deeply embedded in terms of their algorithms and software. Next slide, please. So for the purposes of this discussion, um, I wanna clearly distinguish what we mean by AI and machine learning, okay? So when we talk about AI, we're, th we're talking about knowledge representation and reasoning with ontologies and rules. So that means semantic graphs, uh, executable processing, and reasoning across multiple domains. And when we talk about machine learning, um, we're talking about neural networks, which are closely related to signal processing, um, data mining, uh, learning the structures of sequences, identifying objects, events, anomalies, and um, eventually remembering things. And so why these two um, uh, distinctions are quite important at the moment is that the technologies for AI and machine learning are somewhat fragmented. If you look at AI, uh, it's very good at providing a bird's eye view of concepts um, and for the construction of graphs and for decision-making and re changes of reasoning that are transparent and very flexible, okay? But there's no, effort by these semantic graphs to sort of remember anything, okay? Conversely, on the machine learning side, uh, you can train a machine to solve 
a very, very specific task. Like, for example, you can train a neural network to, to identify, you know, 100 different species of flowers. Um, you can train machines to remember uh, sequences of um, uh, data and streams of data and then identify anomalies in what's happening, okay? But if you, if you want to understand how, the, how these machine learning algorithms are working, the, the state of the art is they definitely lack transparency. So they, they, they provide complementary services, but they don't naturally fit together. Next slide, please. So this project essentially um, poses the question, well, given that semantic state-of-the-art semantic modeling and model based and machine learning are both useful but quite distinct, maybe there's some benefit in trying to figure out how semantic modeling and machine learning can work together as a team um, to uh, provide side-by-side -side support for the development of digital twins. And so the research challenge that we're looking at is how do you design digital twin elements and their interactions um, to develop tools for model-based centric engineering and also digital twin operating system environments for observation, reasoning, and control? So you can imagine having a digital twin environment uh, providing computational and reasoning support for a drone landing on an aircraft carrier. So if this project is to be successful, you know, what kinds of things might you expect? Well, what we're looking for is knowledge to guide architectural development of future digital twins enabled by AI and machine learning technology. Next slide, please. Okay. So in the bigger picture, um, on the model-based systems engineering side, this challenge is closely related to digital threads. And so in model-centric engineering, you can think, and, and you look at the evolution of a, a system from concept through to refinement, you can think of models as being graphs that essentially evolve in response to the concerns at the various stages in the um, life cycle. And so you have an evolution of graphs uh, and corresponding transformations punctuated by some sort of decision making and actions that are going to be taken as the result of the decision making. So a good, re a reasonable place to start in terms of understanding this opportunity is to look at graphs, their attributes, and how they, how machine learning might understand graphs and various types of operations. Next slide, please. Okay. So this picture shows what we're trying to, to achieve um, and the pathway that we're going to explore. So uh, on the right-hand side, there are three, three boxes, okay? Uh, box one is multi-domain semantic modeling. Box two is semantic modeling and data mining. And box three is teaching machines to understand graphs, okay? So we have been thinking about box one for approximately maybe the past five years. And we have a framework for uh, basically co-development of data, ontologies, and rules which I'll explain in a little more detail in just a moment. Box two is all about data mining uh, um, using algorithms that were developed primarily in the 1990s and how the data mining algorithms might uh, work mutually side by side with the semantics. And then box three is what we're currently working on is, okay, how do I take the machine learning and to what extent can the machine learning understand graphs and various types of graphs operations. And so in the back of your mind, you should be thinking, okay, well, this machine learning sounds kind of cool, but really what will the machine, machine learning do? Next slide. Okay, so what we're gonna do is walk through these three steps, one, two, three. And the first step is development of a template for multi-domain semantic modeling. Next slide, please. Right, so if you wanna sort of understand you know, what such a system might do, uh, you don't actually really need to go very far. So this is a picture of a small scale system of systems. It's just a traffic intersection outside my office at the University of Maryland. And if you just stand there with a camera and take a picture, you can see that there's many different domains involved in 
this, the activities that are taking place, right? You have a road network, you have traffic lights, you have pedestrians, automobiles. And in order for a vehicle to safely traverse the traffic intersection without causing an accident, there's a lot of pretty complicated reasoning that needs to take place, okay? You need to observe, you need to evaluate, you need to reason, you need to take actions. And just achieving this task is complicated because there are multiple domains, there are multiple streams of and different types of data. It's an event-driven system, for example, traffic lights. Uh, it's dynamic and it's time critical. You can't take all day to get across the traffic intersection. You need to hustle once the, the light turns green. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a starting point for understanding how you might synthesize this class of problems. And so over the past five years, we've worked on a variety of different problems. So this is really just a summary of where we are. And so our philosophy of development is one footing for ontologies, rules, and data. So in contrast to what other people in the community have done, where we're exploring opportunities for developing the ontologies alongside the rules and the data and thinking about how they might interact. Um, we use the foundation level ontologies like space and time, but we don't necessarily extend them. Uh, ontologies visit data models to get individuals. And then we build, try to build a system where the semantic graph dynamically responds to incoming events, okay? Um, and so a preliminary schematic is shown in the bottom part of the picture. From the left, you have data coming. So you, you go out and you know, collect data, store it in a data model. That data model you know, influences the ontologies and the rules. And then from the right, you have scenarios and scenarios correspond to sequences of events. And the events come in and they um, provide input to some to a reasoner or some sort of a semantic graph. And so the system we're really interested in developing for in terms of multi-domain semantic modeling is those four boxes that are inside the red dash box. Next slide, please. Okay. So this is a more detailed picture of what we call the data ontology rule footing. Uh, this is work that was done at Maryland NIST and um, CERC back in 2017. And so domains A and B are the footings that we, we I just discussed. So we have concurrent development of data models, ontologies, and rules. You can see how they're connected. So for example, ontology A, okay, needs to represent the stuff that's stored in the data models, A and B, okay? It also needs to provide the semantics that the rules are going to use. Right? So you develop the ontologies to enable the rules and the ontologies to reflect what's actually in the data. And so we think this is a pretty good way of developing it because if you're going to do some reasoning and you're going to you know, create individuals in your ontologies, at least you can say this semantic model is supported by the data. And the bottom part of the picture shows how we take the ontologies and the rules, um, input them into a semantic graph structure, and then feed streams of events into the semantic graph, and then the semantic graph will dynamically um, respond. So it's not a static system, it's a dynamic system. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me walk through a small number of slides to show you sort of the details of how this would work in a building environment. So at the time, back in 2017, um, we were working closely with NIST, and they have this long-term vision that they want to create, you know, smart buildings uh, where you have, you know, efficient energy control, um, fault, you know, support for fault detection and diagnostics, integration with the grid, and so forth. And so the basic overarching research question is how to use AI and semantics to bring data, context, and algorithms together to support decision making. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh oh, what's happened? Sometimes there's a delay, Professor. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, give, give it like five seconds. All right. So this is the um, framework for box one in the context of detection and diagnostic analysis of faults in HVAC equipment. So you can see the various domain, the participating domains. So we have um, a building, 
We have sensors. We have equipment, fault detection and diagnostics, weather, and occupant. So the first four are associated with engineering, and um, the domains five and six are associated with the surrounding environment. And in each case, we have um, an ontology, we have a model, and we also have rules. And all those ontologies and rules are loaded into the framework for executable processing of events at the bottom of the, of the picture. Next slide, please. Right. So this is shows um, sort of just a snapshot of, of how things work. So this particular problem looked at uh, fault detection and diagnostic analysis. So there's a step-by-step -step procedure where you sort of, you know, observe that something's not working correctly. You form some hypotheses about why something's not working correctly. And then you go out and gather evidence to either support the hypothesis or reject it. So the left-hand side of the slide shows that flow, and the right-hand side shows the corresponding um, semantic uh, representation and the ontology for representing the state, the fault, the hypothesis, and the, the gathering of evidence. Next slide, please. And so um, this slide shows an, a specific application. It's, it's a, only a tiny application, so it's just the top left-hand side of the slide shows uh, just two rooms in a building. Uh, it's actually supposed to be my office and the office next door. There's uh, sensors and then there's people. Okay. And so the bottom right, left, sorry, the bottom left hand side shows the step-by-step the, the -step procedure for the fault diagnostic and analysis. And then the main part of this slide is the right hand side, which shows is just a snapshot of the fully assembled semantic graph and all of the participating domains. So you can see the fault detection, you can see the occupant model, you can see the weather, and you can see the, the, the building and the sensors and how all the pieces are interconnected and the various individuals have attributes that are either you know, evaluating to true or false or have some numerical value. Okay. So this is actually you know, the, 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 the graph, uh, the state of the graph in representing this multi domain problem. Next slide, please. Okay. So the purpose of this picture is to demonstrate or to show how the multi domain evaluation and forward chaining of rules is actually working. So there's two things going on here. First, we need to uh, detect a fault. And then second, we need to diagnose what's happening uh, to to, to determine the, the cause of the fault. And there are four participating domains. There's the building domain, the occupant domain, the fault detection and diagnostics, and the equipment domain, okay? So you might, for example, think that something's broken because you feel cold, but there could be several reasons that something that you're cold. Perhaps you left a window open, or it could be the case that some equipment is broken, okay? So the top left-hand side of this picture shows the chain of reasoning for fault detection. And the bottom, the right-hand side, shows the chain of reasoning for diagnostic analysis, and they're actually linked. And you can see that the reasoning occurs, involves gathering data from multiple domains, make, coming to some sort of a conclusion, and putting the result back in one or more of the domains. Right. Next slide, please. So that's what we were doing back in 2017. And this is Mark Blackburn's version of exactly the same thing, but for a UAV that is required to provide continuous surveillance. And as part of that um, requirement, there needs to be support for refueling the UAV. So there is a refueling plane. There is a, a cable or a, and, and a connection valve. And in order for this connection valve to basically refuel the, the drone, there is mechanical concerns, electrical concerns, operator concerns, communication concerns, fire and safety. And of course, I'm sure there's many things that can go wrong. And so if you would actually elaborate the procedure that I just described in terms of the fault detection and diagnostics, you would see that the interaction among these domains is probably exactly the same as in the building. Okay, so it's, it's the same sort of problem. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so this takes us up to about the end of 2017. And then the next thing was, well, okay, we've done this multi-domain semantic modeling. We're pretty happy with that. Uh, what comes next? And what we can do is add on data mining. Next slide, please. Right. So um, this uh, avenue of work was actually triggered by Paristu's um, postdoc at NIST and the need to come up with an idea that would be an extension of her work, but not the same thing. So her original idea was to say, well, I think I'm tired of the semantic modeling. I'm going to go and learn about machine learning, uh, focus on machine learning instead. And then after some time, we thought, well, maybe a better idea would be to understand how the semantic modeling and the data mining can work together as a team. And so we actually, we scribbled down a, a diagram. I think it was on a napkin at Starbucks. This is essentially this picture that shows the knowledge representation and the machine learning working together. You can see the roles of the ontologies, the rules and the data. And that was good because we knew how to do that part. And together, the knowledge representation and the machine learning could support some sort of AI decision-making activity for enhanced building monitoring. Okay, so it's definitely different than the, the PhD, and it's a nice step forward in terms of, um, you know, building better systems. Next slide, please. Right. <clears throat> so now we've evolved from box one to box one plus box two. And in terms of data mining, so data mining is really a subset of machine learning. And the algorithms for data mining basically fall into three types. You've got algorithms for classification, algorithms for clustering, and algorithms for evaluating association relationships. And most of these algorithms were worked out either in the late 1980s or the early, you know, in the 1990s. So they're all very mature at this point. Uh, and there's plenty of software uh, available either in Python and Java to, to do the corresponding computations. And so really the, the main challenge is to figure out what kinds of things can you do with the data mining to support the semantic modeling, okay? And so for example, if you have a very large problem, uh, you might use data mining to, fig to, to determine the best way to arrange your ontologies, okay? Refinement of ontologies, okay? Or perhaps how to organize your rules so that your decision-making is efficient. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, to test this idea, um, we teamed up with a faculty member at IIT in Chicago and looked at in the problem of energy consumption in two and a half thousand buildings in Chicago. And so we have the basic framework that we've been talking about. And so you can sort of cast this as, well, this would be a stepping stone to creating a city operating system, okay? And so you would observe various aspects of the city. That would be the input. You would uh, gather the data, gather the ontologies, and gather the rules for the urban uh, area. And then collectively, the semantic representation and the machine learning would provide some sort of decision making for the various kinds of processes that need to exist in the city. And so in this study, we wanted to know what factors are strong indicators of energy consumption in buildings. And it was a very, very interesting thing to do because you might have some initial ideas about what you think is important. And at least half of your ideas will either not be supported by the data or they're just wrong. Okay. So it was, it was great. Next slide, please. Okay. So here's the two boxes extended to um, include um, uh, data mining. And in this particular context, we only needed clustering and classification. And they are both algorithms that, can, that come under the umbrella of unsupervised machine learning. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a summary of, um, of the work that was done. Uh, the top left-hand side shows uh, the buildings in Chicago. And the remaining pictures show the software uh, analysis uh, from a tool called Weka, which stands for Waikato Environment for Knowledge Analysis. It's open source software. You're you know, freely available to get it. Please go ahead. Next slide, please. Right. So this brings us to the main topic of what we're about now, 
which is semantic modeling and machines trained to understand graphs. And so what you should be thinking is, is this even possible? And what will the machine learning do? Next slide, please. OK, so here we are. We're now at box three. And as I mentioned before, a lot, it's driven by the, the observation. A lot of model-centric engineering boils down to representation of systems as graphs and sequences of graph transformations punctuated by decision making. And so what we're interested in is exploring opportunities for training machines to understand graphs, and we're going to use autoencoders. Next slide, please. But right. so there's once you start going down this road, there's many questions come up. Uh, what types of graphs are easy for the machine learning to work or to learn, and which are hard? Uh, what can the machine learning do that the uh, semantic can't do, and vice versa? Uh, how can the machine learning improve the semantic modeling? Um, how will the interactions between these layers work? Okay. Um, and how well will these techniques work when the corresponding graphs and their attributes are you know, dynamic? Next slide, please. Right. So you might be wondering, okay, um, this, this story sounds really good, but is this, is the technology even where it needs to be? Okay. So, um, this slide shows neural network architectures, or sort of what you might consider state-of-the-art AI, back in the time frame 1980 through 1990. So there were neural networks. You could develop neural networks with hidden layers. And with a neural network for a hidden layer, you can do various kinds of classification. Okay? And so when you look at what's happening with Apple and Google today, uh, this is all very well. But this certainly is not the capability that's driving what's happening in 2020. Next slide, please. So there must be more to it. And so you fast forward from 1990 to about 2000. And the first thing that happened was the development of recurrent neural networks, which allows you to learn sequences of data streams. And so I'm not going to get into any of the technical details about how that actually works here. OK, but but this is a big step forward. You Now you can actually start to remember things. Next slide, please. And so you can do interesting things. You can learn uh, about streams of text. Okay, you can learn about a sentence, or you can learn about the complete works of Shakespeare. Um, and then once you've done that, uh, you can you can um, detect anomalies in time series events, or you can even do predictions. Okay, um, of time series. Uh, there's a very interesting book called Generative Learning, Deep Learning, that shows how these techniques. Um, can be used to actually, you know, generate art, uh, generate music, and so forth. Next slide, please. All right. So for that purposes, we're interested in graphs. And so there's two basic approaches to graphs. So on the semantic side, there's a traditional approach to graph representation where you do things like, I mean, you can you build a graph of a model, you use an adjacency matrix, and then you can answer all kinds of questions like, you know, what's the shortest path? Uh, are the, is the graph fully connected? Solving matching problems? How to sort the graph to, um, you know, provide some topological pathway? Um, and all these algorithms are pretty well developed, and the software freely available for that. And the machine learning world comes at the graph problem from a completely different perspective. What it tries to do instead is take the graph and develop embedding vectors. And those embedding vectors can um, can encode the, uh, information about the neighborhood, but also information about the semantics of the particular domain. And so the goals are somewhat different. You can have node classification, clustering, uh, anomaly detection, which I just mentioned. And then you can do things like link prediction and build recommendation systems. Next slide, please. So this slide shows, it's a pretty busy slide, but it shows um, the various strategies that are available for learning graphs. And so one of the things that's important is to realize is that in this machine learning world, the graphs that are important to most people actually can be orders of magnitude larger than what, what um, you know, your average engineer would be in, um, concerned with. Um, you know, for example, they might want to, use machine learning to understand the graph structure of Facebook or Pinterest or something like that, where you have billions of nodes. 
And it's unlikely that a systems engineer is going to be dealing with billions of nodes. You may have thousands of nodes instead. Next slide, please. OK. So as I mentioned, you can do link prediction. Uh, and you can develop what's called graph autoencoder. Um, and so what comes along with these techniques is the need or the desire to develop various kinds of neural network architectures. And so um, these tasks kind of vary. And sometimes you need a high degree of accuracy in, in what the machine learning is going to do for you. And other times it doesn't really matter. So if I'm designing a neural network architecture to recommend beer versus wine, it doesn't really matter if I'm wrong a quarter of the time. But if I'm going to use a graph to represent traceability relationships in a life critical system, I need to, under, to know that my graph, that my machine has the same understanding of the graph as in the physical world. Otherwise, there's going to be big problems. Next slide, please. OK, so this is what we're working on right now. And it's just the first step, teaching machines to learn the topology of graphs. Next slide, please. OK, so we have um, um, the procedure we're following. This is primarily Maria's work. Um, she has an input graph. We design an encoder, uh, then a decoder, and then we have an output graph. And the idea is we want to design the encoder, decoder, embedding relationship so that the output graph is topic logically consistent with the input graph. Next slide, please. And so as a starting point, we have a small family of graphs. Um, that they, you think of these as test cases. They have different kinds of structures. And we want to basically know, can we teach our machines to understand these various kinds of, of, struct, of, of graph structures? So this is, you can think of this, this is like learning how to walk before you can run. Next slide, please. Right, so here, this is where we are right now. So we have our, our, our family of test graphs. We have an encoder process. We have a um, embedding layer uh, of neurons that basically acts as the glue between the encoder and the decoder. And then we decode the, the embedding vector. And we want to know, do we have the same graph structure? And so here you can see the green nodes are the input and the gray nodes are the output. And the table shows the minimum number of neurons required to learn the structure of this graph. And so you can see, OK, the graphs on average have maybe a half dozen nodes. And the embedding vector can actually be considerably smaller. OK, right. Next slide, please. So the next question is, well, it's fine to have um, graphs that only have six nodes. Uh, is there any hope that this um, system can scale? And the answer is yes. So the left-hand side of this picture shows a water network. It contains, I believe, 35 nodes uh, connected into a variety of structures. There's an encoder process, um, an embedding vector, and then a decoder process. And um, the graph right in the middle of the slide shows the cross entropy as a function of iteration. And it's essentially the learning process. And so the, the key question is, uh, is design of the embedding layer. How many neurons do I need in the embedding layer to actually make this work? And so Maria fiddled around with us for a, a while. And the answer is 74. OK, so if I, have, uh, if I have fewer than 74 nodes in the embedding layer, I'm not going to get the, the correct output graph. Um, but if I have at least 74 is like the sweet spot and you can see what the, in, um, and so it's, I, the output is, is, um, uh, isomorphically consistent with the input. Next slide, please. Okay. So looking forward, um, there are a lot of interesting questions that this work raises. Uh, in the water network that I just showed you, um, we have 35 nodes in the network, but she needed 74 nodes that uh, in her embedding layer. And so this suggests that as the scale, as size of the networks increases, the 
the requirement for the embedding layer, in fact, is going to grow. It may even grow exponentially. So we need to do several things. First, it would be really nice to have some sort of a formula for understanding how to do the design of the neural network architecture for specific kinds of graph. Hopefully, we can just have a formula for that. We need to explore opportunities for composition of the neural network architecture um, and then design basic mechanisms for the semantic machine learning interaction. So that's Professor, what we're almost, Sorry to interrupt. Uh, okay. yeah, you're almost out of time. You have a little okay, well, this is almost the last graph. Okay, okay sorry. Okay, fine. And um, next slide, please. Um, and so if you wish to contact us, um, here is our contact information and um, we'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Austin. I think that was, a, that was longer than, that was longer than the test run. <laughs> well, technically we have one minute left. There <laughs> are no questions in the chat, but. Okay, yeah. fine, probably everybody's gone home. <laughs> But maybe some people will watch it later. Exactly. We saved the best for last. Yeah. <laughs> there are over 20 people. So yeah. A lot of people saw it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. How many people did you have coming from industry? Actually, more than 30 people now that I see it. So what do I need to do now? Is anyone going to ask any questions? Um, well, I guess I could I could pose a question. Um, so it looks like you've identified the graph, the the need to bring machine learning technology a little bit closer to graphs, and then mm -hmm. that's the bridge to get to semantics. Is that the uh, the only approach or just the most promising? Well, no, it, okay, so we, we already know how to do the graphs on the semantic side. I mean, right. by default, yeah, the, it, is, it, it is the semantic, is, it is a graph. Yeah. And so really the question is, how can the machine learning help? Hmm. And at the moment, um, and there, there are many, many complications on this, right? Um, for example, at the moment, we're just learning undirected graphs. Um, and and you have to we we still need to explore okay well in the systems engineering world a lot of graphs are directed okay and then of course then they have attributes the attributes could be on the edges or the attributes could be on the on the nodes um some people have proposed uh strategies where they try to learn the structure of the graph and the attributes at the same time and for many applications i think that's probably a mistake because the, the, the structure of the graph might be reasonably static, but the attributes could change quite quickly. And so we just need to explore these opportunities and to figure out, okay, you know, what is the range of problems where this machine learning can be useful? Um, I think it's early days. That was very exciting. It is exciting. And then, we've got, and then after all that, we've got to figure out how to make them talk to each other. <laughs> we haven't even got to the main part. Got, got to build those circuits. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like creating Lego blocks at the moment. You know, I mean, we haven't even put them together. But it was pretty cool. I mean, when Maria got the water network, I was like, okay, there's a chance this can work. Yeah. But there's there, there's no free lunch. It just, it just doesn't exist. We, we had a, a last question here, I guess, uh, looking for a ballpark estimate on how many years of learning does a person need to work on both the, to apply AI and machine learning to systems engineering? Well, we had an advantage because we started on the semantic side. I've been thinking about the semantic side, which is sort of box one and box box one, probably for five years. Um, just from a, a technical standpoint, I mean, you know, so we've been using a tool called Apache Java and you really need to know Java quite well, just to, just to learn how to build applications in that tool. Well, that eliminates 90% of people right there. That's before you even get to the machine learning. So it's, I'm not here to tell you it's easy. 
it's difficult to find students. <laughs> right. And so where where would someone maybe start with the on the semantic side, bringing that into systems engineering? Someone was wondering maybe where they where they can read more. Um, well, we have papers on my homepage. Um, you can look at find um, like Paris's PhD thesis, and she has a, a whole pile of journal papers. Maria has journal papers. Um, if they just go to my homepage, that's that's a good place to start. And you know, if you want to know more, email us, and we'll be happy to talk to you. Great. Well, thank you again for your time and the talk today, Dr. Austin. You're very welcome. Thank you very much.